Welcome to Workforce Central, the official podcast of the National Association of Workforce Boards. Stay tuned as we explore the latest resources, thoughts, and trends in workforce development. And now, here's your host, Ron well, Painter. You're tuned in to Workforce Central, the official podcast of the National Association of Workforce Boards from Washington, D.C. I'm your host, and I am live today in, at Drexel University with Dr. Paul Harrington, mm -hmm labor economist here and director of the Center for Labor Market and Policy. Paul, welcome. Welcome back. Th th thanks, Ryan. I um, want to continue the conversation. We have been talking about, uh, obviously, the labor market, the new numbers. Let's turn our, let me turn our attention to, to youth. This is something, youth employment, unemployment, whatever, it's something you've spent a lot of time. Mm -hmm. It's your background with Andy Sum in, in looking at youth. Mm -hmm. What's the what's the situation with youth as you look at at the report this month's report? Right, it's it's not it's still quite poor. Um, we so so the fundamental measure we like to use with youth is the employment to population ratio, which just says of all the kids aged sixteen to nineteen, what fraction of them have a job? And you know the answer this month for July was twenty eight percent. And, and if we went to July of, of uh, 1999 or 2000, it would be about 50, 55. I was just going to ask you. I mean, we focus on that. We talked earlier um, in the earlier broadcast about um, unemployment isn't always a, a great number to look at with mm -hmm. youth. Have Has this youth participation level always been low? When wasn't it low? What were the... what? Characteristics have changed the dynamics around youth employment. Okay, so so if you go back to the early post World War II period when we first started measuring these things, the fraction of kids with a job, depending on where you are in the business side, because remember kids are more vulnerable to you know a, a down economy; they're more likely to lose their job. But somewhere between forty and fifty percent, on average, of all kids sixteen to nineteen have a job. Okay, from basically nineteen fifty to two thousand. Okay, and it bounces around a little bit, but it stays at that level. And then over the last 15 years, something really dramatic changed. And the fraction of kids 16 to 19 and also young adults 20 to 24, excuse me, who work, really collapsed. Um, we went from half the kids working in, in 99, 2000 to only a quarter by 2009, 2010. And it was just kind of continuous. It didn't matter where we were in the business cycle we just quit hiring kids. And by 2010, we're down to just a quarter of the kids working. Here we've had, now it's five and a half years of recovery. Recession started, recovery recession was July of 2009, so it's actually six years of recovery. We got back three lousy points on the employment rate for kids. We went from 25% to 28%. Wow. With an unemployment rate of 5%, we should be at 45 Yeah, what has, what has changed this market for youth so dramatically? I think, I think, uh, a number of things. I think that that in the last, um, I, I think that we've had 15 years of great economic turbulence. Um, if you look at the 1980 to particularly the 2000 period, and even prior to that, I mean, it was basically GDP growth averaged about 4% a year, 3.5%. I mean, it was a strong period of economic growth in the post-World War II period. And, you know, the pace of economic growth is just really slow. We just don't get GDP growth the way that we have in the past. Because the rest of the world is catching up? No, or? because I think we've just been policy stupid um, and, and just failed to figure out how to generate growth. There's, there's no good reason uh, you know, for us not to get 3.5% growth, 4% growth during a period of recovery. I mean, it's just, there's just no reason for it. Um, you know, we've just done some stupid things. Um, and and, and so, so we've had kind of this 15 years of pretty of not very good GDP growth, kind of up and down, a lot of turbulence. So a consequence of this is, is that, you know, kids are at the bottom of the labor market. So that, so I think the macroeconomic condition itself has not been favorable for kids. When you create that excess labor supply, the second thing that's happened is, 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 is that we brought, we have brought in a lot of foreign born kids, foreign born adults who have, who have low levels of educational attainment. We've seen tremendous penetration of them in traditional teenage markets. You know, employers clearly prefer those workers, uh, to teens. No question about it. Because and, well, I'm going to get to that, but, okay. but but the general answer is behavioral characteristics. Okay, and then the third thing we've seen is is that after after you saw the carnage in the stock market and the housing market in 2008 2009, we saw was a pretty sharp rise in the job market attachment of people 55 and older. Okay, and in fact, 
This is true. It's true this month. The only group where we see rising labor force participation is among people 55 and above. The most rapidly growing element of labor force attachment in the country are people aged 65 to 74. Their labor force participation is rising more rapidly than anybody. Not just the absolute number of them because of the baby boomers. Their participation rate is rising. I was going to say that's, to me, that Uh, is amazing. That's very surprising given what we, we hear on a fairly regular basis around the bias to in, in, ho- in hiring people that, like me, have a little, have a little or a lot of gray. No, the, the, the bias is against kids. Um, so so, so you, you kind of have a lot more, you have a weak labor market environment generally, and then a lot of not very skilled labor supply to take teen jobs. Um, and we, so we've seen a lot of, a lot of foreign-born workers penetrate teen labor markets, but also a lot of older workers uh, penetrate. What kind of got me onto the older worker thing is I was driving on a turnpike in Pennsylvania, and I went to a Burger King, on sadly. And there was these two little old ladies who were probably in their early 70s. They were men in the place. I thought, boy, that's a tough job, you know, yeah, at that is. age. So what you saw happening was you had this carnage. You know, people just saw their assets just crumble back in 2009, 2008, 2009. And even though those assets have been, you know, been largely restored, at least the stock market side, not the housing market side, you know, there's less trust in it. People, you know, when they get their statements every quarter from their investment companies, they don't really, they don't know what that means anymore. It's not, they don't treat it like it's money in the bank. So the hedge then is, if I'm not really sure what I'm worth, what do I do? I work well. I better go to work. Right. So we're seeing a lot of re-entrance of older workers come into the job market, moving to the teen labor market, but also among better educated people, they just stay in longer. They retire, they're delaying retirement. Because of that uncertainty about, you know, the 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 value of the, I think in part the value of the assets that they hold. Are they, you know, if I saved up a million dollars in stock assets, is it is it really worth a million bucks? You know, when I go to sell it. You mentioned earlier behavior. Mm-hmm. It does the employer trust that the soft skills that we hear a lot about the showing up to work on time, taking supervision, feeling some sense of responsibility about your job. So Does the employer feel like they get that with an older worker? So 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 we did a we did a series of we, we contacted about two hundred employers with Nancy Snyder up at the Commonwealth Corporation in Massachusetts, trying to figure out what do employers think about hiring kids? And we used a kind of an interesting questionnaire because what we what we tried to do was not get the employer to talk about why they didn't like kids. To get the employer to talk about why other people in their industry didn't like it. Okay. And you got more little okay. more kids. It's not you, it's yeah. somebody else yeah. doesn't like kids. Tell us about and, that. And, you know, and marketing studies do this all the time. Right. You know? okay. so we tried to steal from those people a little bit. And what we found was is, you know, and not su- not surprising, but but that, you know, on uh, the one of the when you when you look at when you look at the hierarchy of proficiencies required in the labor market, there's four things, right? There's ability, which is basically cognitive ability, reading, writing, and math. Second is knowledge. So it's, it's, you know, understanding auto repair, understanding welding, understanding physics. You know, it's the body of knowledge that you understand. Third is something that are called skills. And skills are, are, are things that are kind of like you learn on the job about how to communicate, how to interact with people and the like. And then the fourth thing that's, that is of the, that, that, that in that hierarchy are what I think of as non, they're sometimes called non-cognitive traits. I call them behavioral traits. These are things like, uh, uh, attendance, persistence, respect, um, that, that employers. So, so when you, when you look at this hierarchy and you say, when, when employers are deciding, you know, what they, what, when they're making a decision, what do they look for? So I analyzed all this data from the ONET system to try and figure this out. And what you find is, is academic, the, the cognitive ability is very enormously by occupation. There's a lot of occupations where cognitive ability don't matter. Okay. There's also a lot of occupations where knowledge doesn't matter very much. Okay. It just doesn't, it's not important. There's a whole other set of occupations, fewer, where these kind of cross occupational skills don't matter, but that's, the number of them is less. Communication, it turns out, is pretty important. But across all occupations, always and everywhere, these behavioral traits are fundamental, and if you don't have them, the employers don't like you. Okay? So you could be the greatest nuclear physicist in, in the world, but if you don't show up to work, they don't like you. Okay. And if you don't interview well. Coming, and if you don't interview well, or, 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 but also, you know, but, but it's like reliability, dependability, and the like. And so what, what employers basically do is they screen for that. They set up a, a screening system, and they look, they, the screening system is designed to, to, for you to signal behavior to you. Okay? So kids are going out on these. So when a kid shows up with their friend at a retail place where, you know, ability, knowledge, skills, maybe not so important, okay, but behavior around respect, attendance, uh, 
you know, uh, 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 your ability to you that know, sense of customer exactly awareness. Exactly right. Exactly. Where all that stuff is very, you know, matters a lot. You show up with your friend and you're holding a Coke and a uh, cell phone in your hand. Well, you don't know this, but you're just talk. You just spoke to the hiring supervisor, right? And they just tell me, tell me your name. And then that name goes on a list of, uh, this is a person I'm not going to hire. Right? <laughs> right. So, so what happens is, is that, and firms become very sophisticated at this. You know, you go into the, into the big retailers, they are all, they, they, on, the applications are all online, but the applications in them, they actually include a lot of behavioral and, and morality testing questions on those questionnaires, on the, on the applicant. Now, when I've done focus groups with kids, I say, do you take a test when you've applied to Target or, you know, some of these other students say, no, 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 you just fill in the application. And I say, well, do they ask you questions in the application? They say, oh, yeah, yeah. They ask you, you know, everyday practical question. Kid doesn't know he's being tested, but he in fact is. And so, so a company like Walmart, their testing is completely on ethics. It's, it's an ethics test. Um, other tests are, are more occupationally specific, you know, are you going to be a good stock worker or what have you? But, but, you know, at the end of the day, there's, there's, you know, the cost of screenings become very low. And one of the cheapest screening devices to look at and say, you're young, you're not, I'm going to hire the one who's not, you know. And so what we, so what we found is when we contacted all these employers, we pretty, we pretty much did find that employers rated kids' behavioral traits lower than they did older workers and foreign-born workers. So as a consequence of that, I think that's also contributed in this weak labor market environment to, you know, kids, you know, not being able to penetrate very well. And the other thing is, is that kids... You know, the, the, one of the things I also think is, is that the school districts have really pulled out of trying to get kids jobs. They place no value on kids working at all, with the exception of some good career tech ed programs. And, and when I've talked to employers, employ, I've talked to employers who said, I've tried to get in touch with high schools, and I can't get them to get back to me. So I just go look elsewhere. Because their focus is exactly. elsewhere. They're, well, part of it is, when you look at what's happening in the United States, I think this is the other issue on this, is that we've become a one-trick pony with respect to kids. And the complete emphasis is now on post-secondary enrollment. And, and I think that's a mistake. And, you know, and I worked in university most of my life. But, but, but I think it's a big mistake um, uh, to try and push everybody in the post-secondary system, particularly because when you push these kids in and they don't complete, we find the economic gain to that secondary, post-secondary schooling. In Philadelphia, if you drop out of college... Okay, your expected earnings are about four percent higher than a high school grad. Okay, if you get a community college degree, it's thirty-five percent. Get a bachelor's degree, it's about eighty. Wow! So dropping out, it's not worth it. Let me step out a second and remind listeners: you're listening to Workforce Central, the official podcast of the National Association of Workforce Boards in Washington D.C. I'm Ron Painter. I'm here today at Drexel University with Dr. Paul Harrington, and on this segment, we're focusing on youth employment issues. Paul, let me, uh, as you were finishing that up, talking about the, the focus has been on post-secondary. From your standpoint, as you've looked at, at this, from a workforce policy, the new federal legislation, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, the INO to me, the INO really does talk a lot about work-based learning. Do you see that as a as a smart policy yeah. for youth? Absolutely. I, I think that there's almost no replacement for on-the-job learning. Um, and, 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 and I think there's a lot of different kinds of on-the-job learning. Um, some of it is specific skill training, but the way you learn kind of work-based behavioral traits is you go to work and behave. <laughs> and, you know, and, I, and yeah. you know, you're, you're kind of kidding, but, you know, let me ask you this. How old were you when you had your first paycheck job? Oh, yeah. You I know? was like 16. Yeah, I mean, and that's a very common answer, 16, 15, 14. Um, you know, people that are successful in life work at very early ages. And when we've kind of done more rigorous statistical studies, you know, we find that holding educational attainment constant, kids who work while they're in high school just do much better later on in life. And that 16, by the way, wasn't that long ago. Yeah, no, right, right. <laughs> just about, about 45 years. <laughs> Compared to the dinosaurs, it wasn't long at all. No, it wasn't long at all. Um, uh, let me ask you, uh, talked a lot about the, the youth issue. Uh, you've looked at labor markets. You've looked at at this for for some while do the issues really change in in workforce and yeah in the labor force yeah i think they have I, I i one of the things that i think has happened is is that we've had this tremendous expansion of the problem of poverty in the united states you know and and you, know, you had mentioned earlier on this side this idea of a growing gap between people with um a, a, the kind of the loss of the middle class mm-hmm. and, and and the answer to that is is that has happened 
uh, the middle class is, 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 I think, sort of shrinking. The middle of the income distribution is shrinking, certainly. And, um, you know, it's become a little bit more of extreme, and, and that's reflected in the structure of employment in the American economy. Where can we read more about the work that you're doing? Uh, it's we're online. Uh, uh, it, we can reach us at www.drexel slash CLMP. Okay, say that one more time. Uh, Drexel Drexel slash CLMP online. Okay. This is Ron Painter. You've been listening to Workforce Central podcast of the National Association of Workforce Boards.